Okay, well, I see lots and lots of people joining and there's still some joining, which is great, but I'll just uh, maybe kick us off here with a little bit of welcome to everyone, wherever you are in the world, in the Tuck community. Uh, as always, I hope that you're safe and healthy and taking care of yourself. Uh, as I said, beautiful day here in Hanover. Uh, Chip Berg is joining us from the Bay Area. Chip, I hope it's beautiful out there. Welcome to the Tuck School. Uh, and it's wonderful that everyone's making the time to join us for another one of our um, signature speaker series here at the Tuck School, View from the Top. This is where we have the opportunity to spend a bit of time with and learn from some of the most impactful leaders in business and beyond uh, in our world. Um, and this has been a great series. This is actually the last one of the academic year. I'll give a huge thanks uh, to Allison Green in the MBA program office. Allison orchestrates a lot of things View from the Top. She's been a great partner. Shannon and all our great colleagues in Tuck IT make it happen. And of course, uh, everyone in the community who joins us for these events. So with that as a little bit of housekeeping, welcome for this afternoon's View from the Top. We're, I'm, I'm delighted to have with us Chip Berg. Chip is the CEO and president of Levi Strauss and Company, uh, which as many of us know, is one of the world's largest brand name apparel companies and a global leader in jeans wear. Chip, as I will show and showed you earlier, I've got my 512s here on, which I love wearing, and I see you wearing what, uh, the, the, uh, as well, so thanks. Um, let me say a little bit about Chip, and then we'll just start the conversation. And um, a little bit into the conversation, we'll bring in Catherine Keene, who's one of the View from the Top Fellows. She's a T21 to help moderate questions that you may have for Chip. Uh, as always, feel free to throw them into the uh, into the Q&A function here, and we'll just have a wide range of conversation about uh, lots of things in our world. Again, Chip is president and CEO of Levi Strauss and Company, one of the world's largest brand name apparel companies. Uh, Levi's, Dockers, Signature by Levi Strauss, Denizens are their brands, uh, sold in well over 100 countries worldwide, 14,000 plus employees, thousands of retail outlets around the country and around our world. Um, Chip has been in this role for coming up on 10 years. Uh, he joined Levi Strauss and Company in September of 2011. Uh, before then, he had an extremely accomplished 28 year career at Procter and Gamble. Uh, he's a self-described person who grew up in brand management and thinks about brand strategy culture in a way that I think is uh, few CEOs have had the success that he has in thinking about these issues. When he was at P&G, among other things, he helped integrate Gillette into P&G after that $57 billion acquisition in 2005. Uh, he helped turn around and escalate successful brands like Swiffer, like Old Spice. Uh, he also serves uh, in recent years as the non-executive chair of the board of HP Incorporated, the printing and personal systems company. Chip, with all that, I know how busy you are. Thank you for making the time. Welcome to Tuck. It's great to be here, Matt. I'm psyched to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Uh, uh, why don't we, um, I'm going to start with one of the many accolades you have actually and a question on this, which is uh, in 2019, Fortune Magazine named you one of the world's greatest leaders uh, and you're widely recognized there and elsewhere for having values driven leadership. So the first question I'd like to put to you is um, when you think about your accomplishment as one of the world's greatest leaders, what are one or a couple of qualities that you think um, make you a great leader or make others think of you as a great leader? And at the same time, um, is there some aspect about your leadership that's a gap that you find yourself still working on even with all the accomplishments that you have? Ooh, um, okay, great place to start. Um, you know, I think leadership has changed. I, when I graduated from college back in 1979, I went into the army and uh, you know, a lot of what I learned about leadership was as a junior military officer stationed at the time back then in what was West Germany in the middle of the Cold War. Wow. Yeah. And back then leadership was, we're gonna take that hill, let's go. And it was being able to you know, set a vision in a direction and get people to move in the same direction at the same time. And it's, leadership has changed a lot over the, the last 40 or 45 years since I started my career in the military. Um, you know, for me, I would say there are a couple of um, characteristics that, that make for strong leaders. And, and I think I kind of, I'm sort of also self-describing myself, but I think humility is really, really important. Um, you know, I'm, I always tell people I'm not the smartest person in the room. I know I'm not the smartest person in this virtual room, um, that I've always got something to learn. And that humility, you know, makes me, I think, a hungry learner. Um, the, the pandemic over the last year has really heightened the importance of empathy as a leader. Um, I do meetings in people's bedrooms now because we're Zooming and Microsoft Teaming 
all the time. And, and it's made me much more empathetic about um, the full life that every one of my employees is dealing with, um, particularly during the pandemic. I think uh, curiosity is important as a leader. You know, that kind of leads to asking lots of questions and, and always, again, being a hungry learner. Um, decisiveness is important. Um, being willing to make the hard decision. You know, at the end of the day, um, I like to say it's always better to do the harder right over the easier wrong. But I, you know, what I find paralyzes a lot of people as they grow into leadership positions is not being willing to make a decision. And indecisiveness is just absolutely a killer to organizations. You know, make the decision and move on. And you know it's better to be to make a decision and be wrong and learn from it than to not make a decision and paralyze an organization. And then the last thing I think is really important, um, and and again, I think the pandemic has really highlighted the importance of of having a purpose. You know whether that's for you as an individual or if you're leading a company for your company. But, but having a sense of purpose, a mission that you're, you know, constantly chipping away at. And, um, you know, I, I would say for me as a leader, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still learning and, uh, and, you know, and I'm not perfect. Um, and there are always going to be gaps. I mean, you know, during, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but during the pandemic, you know, one of the decisions I made when I joined Levi's and, and the company was in really, really bad shape when I joined was we had to fix the business and I was going to put 100% of the energy on fixing the business. And I consciously decided that we're not going to focus on diversity and inclusion at the time. And, you know, I look back at that now and that was a mistake. So there are, you know, always opportunities to continue to learn and to grow and to, to work on strengthening your muscles in, in some of these important areas of leadership. And I constantly am learning and, and trying to get better at it. Hmm. I think in a previous lifetime, you did attend the Tuck School because when we talk about wise, decisive leadership in our mission statement, Tuck develops wise, decisive leadership better than the world of business. We talk about confidence, humility, empathy, judgment on when and how to take risks. So thank you. When you take off humility, empathy, curiosity, decisiveness and having a person, a purpose that really resonates with us. So that, thank you for that wide ranging overview to start. Can we, can I, can I dig in a little bit about learning? So I love that about being a lifelong learner. And, and, and I heard you say about being a hungry learner. So how do you learn? Like, especially as CEO, because often as people are looking to be led. So what are the habits of learning that you've tried to cultivate? There's a lot of a lot of evidence to show is great leaders are great teachers and great teachers are lifelong learners. So mm -hmm. how do you maintain like in your life habits or your calendar learning? It's funny. It's funny you say that because I say the best way to learn something is to force yourself to teach it. Yeah. And if you have to teach something, you really have to understand it and really, yeah, really yeah, totally. you know, know it. Um, but, you know, I, I do. I, I think, first of all, from a business standpoint, being able to hindsight everything is important you know go back and learn from what you've done like i said it's better to make a decision and be wrong than to make no decision at all and uh i like to say that the only failure is making the same mistake twice it's okay i've made hundreds thousands of mistakes through my career and and it's okay if you learn from it i haven't killed anybody yet that i'm aware of and and it's okay to make a mistake as long as you learn from it. So I've really tried to build the muscle of hindsighting and looking back at everything that we've done and did it work or did it not work? Did it go the way we expected it to or not? And what can we learn from that? And you know, as an example, when I joined this company, we had about 2000 stores. We were a terrible retailer at the time. We've become a much better retailer because we hindsight everything that we do. When we build a new store, it's got you know an economic model that we put into place. Did it hit the economic terms that we agreed to? And if not, why not? What can we learn from that? And it's through that continuous process of just challenging every decision that we've made and whether it worked the way we expected it to or not that has made us stronger in that case as a retailer um, where we make much better 
real estate decisions now. We make much better capital decisions and investment decisions because we're constantly going back and, and reevaluating the quality of our choices. And, um, you know, on some things, we review them with the board of directors as well. So it's, it, it is about having that, that, that hungry curiosity and, you know, the, the willingness to ask the hard questions and accept that sometimes things aren't going to go the way they, they're planned. But if you learn from it, you're going to get better over time. And I think that's part of our story is we've gotten better over time. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, that's clear in terms of all the usual financial and business metrics and, and under your tenure. Can do you literally, can I ask, like, if, I, if, I, if we could peek at your diary, your, your yeah. calendar, like, do you set aside block times and days to reflect and try to learn? Or in terms of the C-suite team you have around you, like, how do you, how do you make that active? I get it in the organization. Yeah. Okay. Lot, so how do you guys actually for, for do me it? personally, um, I, I do have a couple of things that I do. So I do journal every day. Um, wow. Okay. In fact, it's right here. This is my yeah. journal. Yeah. It looks like it's sort of a calendar. Every day is a, every day is a, you know, a day of the week. And, uh, and I, uh, every page is a day of the week. And every night at the end of the day, I just kind of do the brain dump. And I, and I do think back on, I think back on how did I spend my time? Um, did, I, did I accomplish my personal objective? Uh, part of which is touching people, you know, kind of you know, making a difference in people's lives. And, uh, and I reflect on that and I, you know, both from a personal standpoint and family, as well as from a professional standpoint, um, the other thing that, I, that I've done is I, I do have what I would call a couple of really close mentors, um, for lack of a better word, um, you know, elders, wiser people than me. They're not necessarily all older than me, I will say, but, <laughs> right. yeah. um, uh, you know, to, to, to bounce ideas off of. I've got a really good relationship with Jim Collins, the author you know, wrote Good to Great and a whole yeah. bunch of series of books. And he's kind of an academic. He and I are, uh, interestingly, exactly one month apart in age. So we share that. We're both very athletic and, out, and you know, outdoors, outdoorsy. I've, I've brought my leadership team to his organization. We've done a lot of work with them through the years and, and with Jim specifically through the years. And just and he's kind of wise counsel to me and he's outside of the business world and can be really really objective and i talk to him pretty regularly um so that is you know one example uh i've got a couple of examples like that but just and then the other thing that i would say a positive out of the pandemic for me is i've gotten much more connected to ceos outside of my industry um, i was saying to you know i joined the business roundtable about a year ago um, and you know i've gotten to know a lot of the ceos there i'm in a group called g50 which is uh, the top ceos around the world and and all of us as ceos are dealing with a lot of the same issues it doesn't matter what industry you're in you know some businesses yeah. The pandemic has been a huge tailwind. Other businesses like ours, it's been a huge headwind. But being able to kind of, the old saying, it's lonely at the top is true, but being able to commiserate with other CEOs and, and, and compare notes and, and share ideas has been you know, phenomenal. And because everything's been virtual, I don't have to get on a plane and travel somewhere to do it. And, and so that, that has been a real positive that after the pandemic, I'm going to continue to, to really take advantage of. Boy, thank you for being so open and, and, and tangible about how you learn. Because again, I know so many of our students, especially they're building those capabilities. That's why they're here at Tuck. And we talk about being lifelong learners and building those skills. So that's great. Thank you. You, um, you mentioned it, it, in an earlier answer about how the nature of leadership has changed from your time in the army of there's the hill, let's go take it. And, and I'm wondering if we could, you could share a little bit more about that. And, and if I connect it with, I think, why so many people admire you, you have been a voice, you mentioned the business roundtable, with many member companies have signed, CEOs have signed this new statement of purpose that says, we exist not just to maximize shareholder value, but there's four other important stakeholders of employees, customers, suppliers, and the communities in which we operate. And if one Google searches you, you've written op-eds lately and been very public and speaking out on very important social slash business issues, paid leave, racial inequalities in our country, gun violence. So 
that's a preamble to how have your how has your ideas of leadership evolved and how do you find your voice on not just the dollars and cents and financials of Levi Strauss, but more generally on how the organization connects with society? Like how do you define what leadership means for you in those different areas? Yeah, I so um First of all, as I told you before we went live on air, I wasn't on the business roundtable when that um, new credo, if you will, was established. Had I been on the business roundtable, I clearly would have signed it, you know, based on all the areas that were actively engaged. And it was actually the reason they did, um, but when they did that was part of the reason why I joined the business roundtable is I really felt that what they're trying to accomplish now as an organization is very closely aligned what I'm trying to accomplish as a CEO. Um, I, I would say, you know, part of this is me and part of this is the platform of the, of the office of the CEO at Levi Strauss and Company. This is a company where we have a track record going all the way back. We've been in business for 169 years at this point and going all the way back to our founder, Levi Strauss, the man, the myth, the legend himself, the very first year he made a profit, he donated a portion of that profit to a local charity organization here in oh, San wow. Francisco. And so we've always had this concept, which we call profits through principles, that, that we're in business for, for more than just to make a buck for the shareholder. I mean, clearly that is important, but we're in business to, to make the world a better place at the same time. And, and that is part of who we are as a company. So this is a legacy that I felt, I feel part of my responsibility is to live up to the legacy of CEOs before me who had thick skin and who weren't afraid to stick their neck out on important issues of the day. So, you know, for example, we've, we've always stood for equality and, and, you know, basic human rights and, uh, Back in the day when we had factories in this country, in the South and the Southeast, we desegregated those factories 10 years before it was the law of the land and the Civil Rights Act. Um, uh, we were one of the very first companies to offer health care benefits to same-sex partners. Um, when the Boy Scouts uh, banned gay troop leaders back in the early 1990s, we, paid, we, we pulled back all funding of the Boy Scouts. And, and that... It went, in that particular instance, we got over 100,000 letters and emails, 98% of which said, I'm going to stop buying Levi's, and the company did not waver. And, you know, you look back on all of those big momentum type decisions, and clearly the company was on the right side of history on all of those issues. And that's one of the standards that, that we try to hold up is, you know, will, will history judge us as being on the right side of the issue? So, there are a number of issues over the last couple of years that we have kind of taken up um, because of the importance of these issues to society writ large, if you will. And so ending gun violence is something that we wound up wading into uh, initially because you know, we have, we have stores around the country and we have, store, we have a company policy, people aren't allowed to bring guns or weapons to work store managers were really concerned about people walking into their stores in open carry states, you know, with a gun on their, on their, on their, on their belt. And, uh, and so we did what a number of retailers had done. We politely asked gun owners to not bring a weapon into our store. Um, and we did that by the way, after somebody, after somebody discharged their weapon in one of our stores, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Anyway, long story short, um, you know, gun violence is one of the issues that's ripping this country apart. Um, we're not we're not trying to repeal the Second Amendment or anything like that. We're just advocating, along with youth advocates, we are advocating for um, common sense gun legislation that will um, significantly reduce the number of deaths uh, caused by guns. Over 100 Americans a day are are killed by a gun, and so. Um, Anyway, you know, it's it's part of the legacy of this of this company. Um, you know, we we've uh, been very involved in in voting as well. We can talk a little bit about that, but um, we don't wade into these things kind of willy nilly. It's all strategic and well thought out. 
Um, if it's a if it's a new issue, as as ending gun violence was, you know, we vet it with our board of directors, and and really think through how can we make a difference. It's not just about the words, but it's about what's the action that we're putting behind it to yeah. really try to make a difference. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate your candor and how wide ranging this has been, Chip. And I heard you say earlier, again, in the spirit of making mistakes, we make mistakes along the way. That early in your tenure as CEO, perhaps you weren't as focused enough on DEI issues and focusing a little bit on the dollars and cents. And one of you could be willing to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was asked not too long ago, you know, if looking back at my 10 years as CEO, what do I think my biggest mistake is? And that's my biggest mistake um, is, is kind of making diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of a secondary priority to fixing the business. And, you know, when the, when the, racial reckoning happened this past summer with the murder of George Floyd and, and the string actually of just horrific events uh, that unfolded and the pandemic kind of shined a spotlight on, on them. You know, we, as I said, we've always kind of stood for equality and, um, and our actions externally through our, through our foundation um, where we really focus on uh, particularly black and brown communities and whether it's ending gun violence or access to voting and things like that, where we put our money to work from our, from our foundation. I think over the last five years, we've granted more than $35 million to organizations largely in the Bay Area, but, but across the country uh, that are, that are um, really focused on equality and, and ending racism. And, when the George Floyd murder happened, we, we looked at our internal results and our words and actions and everything we do externally not, were not matching what we were doing internally. And, and, and the basic bottom line is uh, we do not have the kind of diverse organization we need to have. And as a result of that, we are not the kind of company that we have the potential to be. We are underperforming versus where I think we could be if we had a more diverse organization. So we, we, I declared a number of very, very specific and concrete actions that we were gonna take to make meaningful progress against creating a culture that truly values diversity and inclusion and creating more of a culture of inclusion in the company. And um, we went, public with our, uh, uh, our diversity results inside the US, all layers of management. Um, we, uh, we went public with a specific set of commitments. Um, and, uh, and in fact, we updated the, the diversity results along with pay equity data that we have both on gender diversity as well as ethnic diversity back in February. And it's something that we're really committed to making meaningful progress on, um, and, and we already have. We've we've hired a chief diversity officer. Um, we've added a black leader to our board who has been a terrific addition, um, Elliot Rogers, who is the chief information officer at Alpha Beauty. So, and he's a retailer, which is awesome, and he's he's going to be a terrific board member, and he's already making our board a better board. So, um, you know, it it. I look back on it, boy, it was a big mistake to not focus on it much earlier. Um, but as I said, you know, it's only a failure if you make the same mistake twice. So we've yeah. declared we're gonna make progress here. We've even, I, I convinced the board to include a metric in the executive management's compensation focused on achieving diversity targets. And so we're, you know, kind of, backing it up with, backing up the, the words with, with real kind of dollars at stake for the executives to deliver on our commitments. Yeah, Chip, I appreciate your um, candor there. Um, it, for those of you, if you haven't read the Levi Strauss annual report, I was looking at it in the past couple of days and right there on you know, page 15, in with all the basic financials is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, our commitment to do more. And there's a lot of language there about progress you've all made, but in that spirit of being lifelong learners, you, you acknowledge there, Here's what we're trying to do. Here's our goal for this year. Here you can go read. So I appreciate you connecting that with a personal level, you learning as a, as a leader. Um, again, we have a great T21, Catherine Keen. 
uh, who uh, I'd love to invite to join us in the conversation ship. We got a little over a half hour left and the questions are uh, pouring into the Q&A. Um, so, uh, and as I, I might've said, we've even had some from alums that uh, were emailing me before, but Catherine, welcome to the conversation. And um, is there a question you'd like to put to Chip and we'll just uh, keep the conversation going. Yeah, thanks so much. Really excited to be here. Going off of this, uh, the really inspiring work that you've done at Levi's related to diversity. We talk a lot about, at Tuck about how it's so important to have diverse teams to create productive dissent in um, conversations and decision making. So we have a question from Matt that is related to that. And it is, how do you as a CEO make sure you hear from those within the organization who disagree with you? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, I've tried to create a culture where bad news moves faster than good news. Good news always tends to move really, really fast, right? Bad news is a little bit tougher. You know, I guess maybe using an example uh, from the, you know, the, the racial reckoning that happened this past summer, one of the things that I did, and it was a, it was a real humbling experience for me. And again, this gets back to the basic leadership trait of humility. But one of the very first things I did, we have employee resource groups and we have a, a black employee resource group, which we call, they call Onyx. And I got with the Onyx team um, shortly after the George Floyd incident and um, started engaging with them on, you know, what more can we do? And uh, it was actually it was that group that said, we need to be transparent with our results. We need to declare we've got an issue here. Um, uh, it, and our ethnic diversity at Levi's, particularly with black leaders, is it, it's, it's not where it needs to be. Uh, national representation of black leaders is about 14%, 13 to 14%. Um, San Francisco is already challenged because the availability in San Francisco is 7%, and that's not an excuse. We need to get to 14%. We need to figure out how we're going to do that. But I, I started engaging with them, and I have to you know, say really, really honestly, it, you know, listening to them talk was like somebody sticking a knife through my gut um, because they started talking about the microaggressions that they live with at work and some of the challenges that, that they've had to endure at work. And, and it really made me realize we don't have an inclusive culture, the kind of inclusive culture that I think we all would want. And um, it, was, it was a big you know, reckoning for me as a leader that we weren't where we needed to be as a company from an inclusion standpoint. I mean, I, I, I knew I didn't have a black leader on my executive team. I didn't realize how much of an impact, you know, young people in their career, being able to look up the ladder, if you will, or look up the, the organization chart and see people like them who have been successful, how important that is in cultivating a career at this, at this company. And, and um, you know, the combination of that plus hearing about the microaggressions that people deal with at work and then hearing about the things that they deal with outside of work. Um, it was just really, really, really personally difficult for me as a leader to say, this is my organization, my company, and listen to how these people feel. And that's what prompted, you know, when we started talking about what can we do to fix this? And the, the list of action steps, including, you know, publicly, um, being transparent about our data was it, it, it came from those conversations with them. And, um, and so, you know, I, again, being humble and, and really being open to listen and being willing to take the hard feedback um, and, and hearing what I needed to hear as a leader and then being committed to act on it. Um, and again, you know, it, at the end of the day, this is also about business. I'm convinced we will be a better company. We will perform better if we have a more diverse organization and, a, and an organization where it's really inclusive. And that includes making sure that bad news travels fast. Um, you know, uh, on, on other issues, uh, I, we have tried to create a culture where people can surface with bad news. And, um, you know, and I, I say all the time, 
you know, the only failure is making the same mistake twice. So if you've got a mistake, let's declare it, let's learn from it, and let's move on. Um, the other thing that I do is I, you know, and during the pandemic, I've been doing it every other week. In fact, I've got one coming up later today. I do a town hall, basically. We call it chips and beer. Cute, right? Chip, beer. <laughs> Uh, back in the day when we were in person, we would do it in our big kind of uh, auditorium, if you will, and we would serve beer and have chips and stuff like that, and then we would webcast it. And then anytime I travel to a market, we'll do chips and beer in that, in that particular market. Well, with the pandemic, and so I was doing it on a once a month basis. With the pandemic, I'm doing it every other week, and we have, we take questions. It, it's basically, I might open it with five minute update on the business and, and or things that are going on. Mm -hmm. um, I will say today that when I open it up, I'm gonna talk about how we're not out of the pandemic yet. And we, we may be facing the biggest humanitarian crisis in our lifetime with what's happening with the pandemic in India right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk about that and the impact that it's having on our team in India and our business in India. But, and the business is clearly secondary. I'm more worried about our team today in India but people can ask anything they want in the chat. And as you know, they can ask it anonymously if they want to. And so I get a lot of tough questions, but um, it's also where I get to learn what's on people's mind. Yeah. Um, what are people really concerned about? I get a lot of questions about career progression, the opportunity to advance. Um, you know, so we've really dialed up from a talent management standpoint, how we career path people. I came from a career path machine at Procter & Gamble. I'm the beneficiary of that. Um, and, and so uh, that's another thing that I do. And, and, and trust me, sometimes bad news surfaces in those chips and beer that wind up you know, getting some follow-up. So I've tried to have different channels where people can kind of surface. You know, obviously we've got the 800 numbers and all those kind of things too that any good company would have. But, um, but, but it's really more creating a culture of learning, where um, a mistake is okay as long as you learn from it. Chip, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the pandemic, and I'm wondering in that context uh, if I could ask a. Um, is it a question about kind of how the pandemic is affecting your business? Actually, this is one of the questions from one of our alums. So um, Steve Seng, remember the great Tuck class of 01 in Dartmouth 95 asked um, the following question about the global pandemic. Um, the pandemic as well as geopolitical tensions around the world seem to be accelerating digital transformation as well as supply chain decoupling for many fashion retailers. So do you see this pivot as a long-term strategy? What has been um, your biggest challenges on this in, in terms of transforming your 167-year-old company? And he says he's a big fan of your Champs-Élysées virtual store in the spirit of uh, digital transformation. Excellent. So thoughts on kind of supply chain and the pandemic, how those things interact? Yeah, so um, it's a great, first of all, it's, it's, an, it's a great question. Um, so the pandemic has changed a lot. I think, you know, people, People are going to be studying the pandemic and the impact that the pandemic has had on businesses for the next hundred years, I think, and how, how it's, what kind of impact it's had on, on consumers and individuals as well. But clearly, one of the big things that happened for us as an apparel retailer um, is a dramatic shift to uh, digital shopping, e-commerce, uh, and online and we had a small online business. We had been investing in it. Um, we were still losing money in it before uh, the pandemic. And when the pandemic happened, I mean, I still remember, you know, as if it was yesterday, it was now more than a year ago when we had to shut all of our stores. You know, initially I thought, well, our stores will be closed for two weeks. They were closed for 10 weeks. Yeah. And we thought uh, the same thing. We said we're going to pause <laughs> in-person classes for two weeks. That's the notice we put to the community. We said, okay, we just got to get through it. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, when, it, when two weeks became three weeks, became four weeks, we realized, you know, Houston, we have a problem. And, um, and so we, we did a very, very hard, quick pivot to double down on our e-commerce business. We had capabilities that were on our roadmap for the next two years that we knew we were gonna need during the pandemic. So, um, for example, we did not have, before the pandemic, we did not have buy online pickup in store. We did not have any kind of, um, you know, virtual or video shopping. 
um, we had just started to build the ability to ship from stores, so to fulfill e-commerce orders from our retail stores. Um, and so we incrementally invested uh, in our e-commerce business uh, probably at about uh, just about this time a year ago. And we doubled down on pulling a lot of those capabilities forward. We knew, you know, buy online pickup curbside was going to be important. Um, so we built that capability really quickly. We had it in the field, you know, uh, when our stores reopened here in the United States, and we've now expanded that capability broadly. We built ship from store and kind of completed that along with uh, an algorithm that's driven by data science that helps us figure out where the best, which, where, where is the best fulfillment vehicle for this particular order. Um, and so if you ever order multiple things from Levi's and wind up getting two or three packages, it's because the, the AI algorithm told us that it's better for us yeah. to do it from two or three different places than from one. Yeah, these and, jeans uh, I'm wearing came in an order where the family ordered it. We got three different packages. That's awesome to hear how that is. Yeah, and I didn't you. know that, but that's why. Yeah, no, the I love it. Yeah. said that's the best way to get it to you. Um, yeah. But but that helped us manage our inventory during a period of time when our stores were closed, and it helped us bleed off some of the inventory that was trapped in our stores. So anyway, that that obviously um, was important. And in that second quarter and the third quarter of last fiscal year, which was most heavily impacted by the pandemic, 70% um, uh, uh, of the consumers that came to Levi's.com were, were new to Levi's.com. They, they, they might not have been new to Levi's, but they yeah. couldn't go to a store. They couldn't go to Macy's. They couldn't go to the Levi's store. So they shopped online. And I think a lot of that is going to be sticky. So our e-commerce business went from about 4% of revenues before the pandemic. It, it, it was 10% of revenues last quarter. That's just our own and operated e-commerce business globally. We went from losing money to making money. It's now been profitable for three quarters in a row. Um, it's, it's still our fastest growing segment, if you will, if you think about e-commerce as a channel. We also look at our digital footprint. So that's our owned and operated e-commerce business along with the pure plays like amazon.com, Zalando, Tmall, those guys, as well as the wholesale.com. So macy's.com or kohl's.com. And that business has been more than 25% of our business for several quarters in a row. And again, it is also the fastest growing segment when you, when you look at it on a multi uh, customer basis. So. Um, it's been really, really important to us. We're going to continue to invest aggressively in building out those digital capabilities. And now a lot of the emphasis is going on creating a seamless consumer experience between um, the digital world and our physical world. We also, during the pandemic, we rolled out an app globally. We rolled out, and in fact, if you, if you download our app and, and sign up for our loyalty program, which we also rolled out globally during the pandemic um, on the app. And if you're a loyalty member, we do special collaboration drops that you can only get if you're a member of the loyalty, you know, our loyalty program and on our app. The loyalty program doesn't cost anything. I'm not selling here, but we've really tried to, you know, build more of a relationship with the consumer during the pandemic. Um, and, and you know, the, we declared at the beginning of the pandemic that we were gonna emerge from the pandemic a stronger company, and we will. We're gonna be financially healthier. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have greater capabilities and we will have connected with consumers in, in a really unique way that hopefully is creating lifelong bonds with this brand. That's awesome, thanks, Chip. Catherine, another question from the many we got? Yeah. Yeah, we have so many great questions in the Q&A. Um, an interesting one from Emily, an incoming Tucky. She asks, with a focus on making the world a better place, including through social justice initiatives and sustainability, will you remove leather from your supply chain or create an alternative uh, for gene patch options and other things uh, for those who want to avoid it for sustainability or animal rights reasons? Yeah, so um, we just had our annual shareholder meeting about a week ago and I got this question there. So um, we, we actually uh, don't have leather patches on the vast majority of the product that we sell. They tend to be paper patches. 
Um, but on our higher quality jeans, and I'm wearing a pair of our higher quality jeans right now, and I've got a leather patch on it. And, um, you know, the first thing I would say is that everything we source, we source sustainably and, you know, up to the very best standards in the industry. And so we're very, very committed to doing this with the right kind of animal welfare uh, programs in place. And, and that gets audited. Um, we are a very, 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 very small consumer of leather. Our main um, uh, raw material and commodity material is cotton. And from a sustainability standpoint, that's where the, the big impact can be. Cotton is a very difficult crop to grow. It requires a lot of water. And, um, and so we've been really focused on how do we make jeans more sustainable and the majority of our focus has gone against cotton growing procedures and cotton uh, alternatives, if you will. Mm -hmm. So right now we have a line of product that has blended, it blended into the cotton. It has hemp, cottonized hemp blended into it. Hemp is a much more sustainable fabric than cotton. It unfortunately feels like burlap but we're working with a supplier that has cottonized it, softened the hemp, and then when you blend it with cotton, you wind up with a material that most people wouldn't even detect that, it, that it's not 100% cotton, but it's way more sustainable. So we've put a, most of our energy there. We are working on cotton, I mean, on uh, leather alternatives. And, um, you know, unfortunately at this point, we haven't found one that really meets our standards. There, there are some interesting technologies coming. And as soon as we can know that we've got a quality standard that is acceptable to the consumer, we will um, convert. But it is, it, because we buy such a small amount and it is such a tiny part of our overall um, sustainable impact, the majority of our emphasis is on cotton. Chip, thanks. Um, there's a couple of questions we're going to see. Can I, oh, I, yeah, I go ahead. More. I, yeah. I, I realized as I was answering that question that I didn't answer the second half of the other question about sustain about su supply chain resilience and the geopolitics of oh, yeah. supply chains. And 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 I and I don't want your alum to think that I was dodging your question. I just kind of forgot part B to the question. But and I'll be real short. Um, I think what has happened, you know, the world moves in pendulum swings, right, or in cycles, I guess. And, you know, we, we went through a period of time where supply chains went from being highly local to regional to global. And I think the pendulum is starting to change for geopolitical reasons. Um, you know, obviously, trade wars and all that stuff have, have had an impact as well. But I think what we're going to start to see uh, pretty broadly across industries. And this is not just an apparel thing. I think we're gonna to start to see more of a move towards uh, regional supply chains again in the future. And, um, and it, is, it is all around this notion of resilience. I think a lot of people woke up and realized they had all of their eggs in one basket. And if that one basket happened to shut down because of a pandemic, all of a sudden you don't have product. Um, for us, um, you, you know, the, uh, we have, over time, we have significantly drained the amount of supply that comes from China. Um, at one point in time, China was you know, double digit percentages of our global supply chain. Today, it's low single digits. And, and what we import to the US is less than 1% of the product that we import into the US is coming from China today. Wow, one so less than 1%. Less than 1%. We have, we have a large, you know, we have a large global business. So we have a very diversified supply chain today. And um, we try to have no more than 20% of our business in any one country and kind of play the portfolio, if you will. So, and that has given us some supply chain resilience. Um, but, you know, with, with uh, the, the geopolitics today and uh, the, the situation between the US and China in particular, I think we are going to see this pendulum move back towards more regional supply chains over time. Yep. Chip, I'm wondering if I could ask you a follow-up question on diversification about Levi Strauss business, not on the supply chain so much, but on, on, the, on your products. Like in your annual report, you talk about a strategic goal of diversifying customers in some sense across geographies, across gender, across products. 
and it's kind of a branding question, I guess, branding strategy. You've got these iconic brands. As you think about, for example, the, the effort to drive your brands into more markets around the world, more balance between men and women, how do you think about preserving the brand equity you have with existing customers and building it out with new ones? Is there a tension there or is it purely additive? How do you think about that dimension of diversifying what you do? Yeah, it's something we've been working on actually since I got here. Um, when I joined this company, uh, the best data I have is US data. But when I joined the company, the average male consumer for Levi's was 47 years old. And, wow. and it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Old Spice story that I like to tell, which everybody knows Old Spice, it's what your grandfather used to wear as cologne. Yeah. Unfortunately, everybody's grandfather was dying and as their grandfathers were dying, so was the brand. Yeah. And you know, we had to pivot the brand and attract new consumers and we focused on, on teenagers and, and that kind of worked and the brand took off. Um, and it is really, really challenging when you've got a core of your customers that are in one demographic and you all of a sudden are gonna go try to recruit a new demographic. How do you do that without alienating your core consumers? You know, it's, it's one of marketing's greatest challenges. And, um, but we have really been focusing on that on Levi's. Today, our average consumer, our average male consumer in the US is 32 years old. Wow. So we've, dramatically, you know, been able to recruit new, younger consumers. And it's through a combination of, of product and, you know, marketing or marketing really resonates with young consumers and then how you reach them as well. So part of the whole Levi's turnaround story was putting the brand back at the center of culture. When, when this brand was great, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, Matt, you know, everybody's got a Levi's story yeah, yeah. and, you know, first date, first kiss, whatever. And, uh, and, and part of turning the brand around was making the brand what it was when I was a teenager, you know, kind of trying to get that mojo back to when I was a kid. And, and part of that was, uh, was about putting the brand at the center of culture. So we define what is culture, culture in this country and, and largely around the world. It's about sports. It's about entertainment, you know, music in particular plays an important role in Levi's history. And so we tried to kind of put the brand back in the middle of those things. And so if anybody's ever gone to Coachella, you know, we have a big presence at Coachella. We're not a Coachella sponsor, but man, we are there and we are doing cool stuff with Venom and it becomes a magnet and, and people come by the Levi's outpost. And so, uh, and we do that with music festivals around the world. So, and that's how we've managed over time to really connect with young people again. And, and obviously product plays such an important part of this as well. And so, uh, you know, from a product standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, uh, from where and how we show up. And I was saying, you know, before we did leave, people scratched their heads when we said we were gonna do Levi Stadium, but, you know, sports is, you know, what happens in big football stadiums? Football, first of all, but massive concerts, massive entertainment, massive cultural moments. And, um, and we had the opportunity to do it with the hometown team, team here, whose mascot, by the way, is Sourdough Sam, which goes back to the Gold Rush, which by the way, is where we go back yeah, to. Yeah. So there was just like this synergy and it's been one of our highest performing marketing investments over the years. Um, and we measure our marketing investments really, really concretely. We get a marketing ROI by medium and, and Levi Stadium has been a great investment for us. So, so that's kind of how we've done it. There is definitely tension, you know, you, you're trying to figure out how to bring in and, and recruit young, young people without alienating your core consumer is always, always a challenge, but we've managed to thread the needle on this brand. No, that's great. Thank you. And we have a tuck alum, Heidi, um, Heidi uh, Falago, who's a TO4 in Massachusetts, and you kind of touched upon it. She asked about, she'd been at uh, p and also when you were there and just kind of lessons from P&G and the Old Spice one, I think, resonates of trying to thread that needle, as you say, of not alienating the grandfathers, but lowering the age and being where culture is. I really appreciate that. That was great. Uh, Catherine, another uh, question. Yeah, to kind of combine a couple questions that have come up in the chat, obviously you talked a lot about different um, social issues, uh, diversity. Uh, what do you think the role is for businesses in 
taking a stance on social issues. Alyssa Lowe, who's a T22, brought up that you recently uh, took a stance on the voting rights issues in Georgia. Uh, Catherine Britt, a T21, also mentioned things like sustainability, supply chain, which you've uh, touched on as well. But how do you uh, decide what the role of business is and then go on to balance the potentially competing interests of different stakeholders? Yeah, so it's a great question. It's also very timely if if you get the Economist, it's on the cover of the Economist. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, you know, so first, the first thing I would say is we we try to be choiceful. We can't do everything. If you speak out and speak up for everything, you, you know, if you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. So we try to be really, really choiceful about it. Number one. Number two is we try to think about what kind of impact does it have on us and our business, and you know, kind of our license to operate, if you will. Um, and, and, I'll, and, and, and that is important. And then number three is we do have a framework. There are certain issues that are kind of, I call them legacy issues for us as a company where I have licenses as the CEO to decide whether we're gonna say something and open our mouths or not. Um, then there are other topics that aren't within that framework that you know, requires me from a governance standpoint to kind of go back and forth with the board of directors and get the board to agree to it. So before we waded into gun violence, you know, that was multiple back and forth sessions with the board of directors. The board actually made our decision and what we were going to do even better because we were going to do a one-year program helping the youth that were activating after the Parkland shooting and, you know, donate, donating a quarter of a million dollars in that year to, to help that youth activation and try to make a difference. And the board said, you know, in for an inch, in for a mile, if you're going to do it, let's, let's commit to at least four years. And we're now in the fourth year of this program and we're going to continue it. Um, so I have this framework. Um, there needs to be kind of, again, you know, if you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. There needs to be kind of good rationale from the business standpoint on why we're weighing into these things. I'll take voting as, as an example. Um, the reason we've been very, very in, active on getting the vote out here in the United States since the midterm elections in 2018. The reason is because in 2016, voter turnout was amongst the worst in any election ever. And so anybody who had any complaints about what was going on with the government or the president or the administration or whatever, if they didn't vote, you got no reason to open your mouth. So democracy only works if, if people vote, if every registered voter has equal and fair access to the polls and goes out and votes. And so the 2018 midterm elections, we created an organization called timetovote.org. Uh, we did that in partnership with PayPal and Patagonia, two like-minded thinking corporate citizens, if you will. And we uh, enrolled over 600 CEOs to commit to give their employees time off to vote on election day. Um, we're one of the only countries, uh, only democracies in the world where election day happens to fall on a work day. And, you know, I can probably get out of work for a couple of hours to go vote, but that's not true of every American. And, and so getting people, getting CEOs to commit to give their people time off to vote was really, really important to get the vote out. The voter turnout in the midterm elections, and I'm not taking credit for this, there were a whole bunch of reasons that drove this, but the voter turnout in the midterm elections was the highest in 40 years. We fired it back up again in 2020 for the uh, uh, presidential election. We had almost 2,000 companies representing more than 10 million uh, employees sign up, 50 states, um, covering the entire country, and and we know what happened with voter turnout, right? So it's important. The reason we kind of wade into these, you know, the the voting laws that are working their way through 45 different states, over 350 pieces of legislation, you know, unfortunately, voting has become a partisan issue, and it shouldn't be. This is an American issue, um, and. And it should be about, we should be doing everything we can as a country to make voting as accessible and equal and fair to every eligible American so that they can vote. Because that is the basis of democracy. And the reason we are committed to this is our economy is premised on having a strong democracy. 
And we saw how fragile our democracy is on January 6th. And, and, and so we really feel very, very passionately that at the end of the day, this is a business issue. Um, and, and I can tell you that our employees are fired up about it, but it is a business issue because the fundamentals of our econo economic system are premised on having a strong democracy. And you can tell I'm pretty fired up about this. Chip, there's a lot you're fired up about, which is great. Um, and I, I have to say the time has flown. We've only got like two, three minutes left. So I'm wondering, um, look, first of all, thank you for spending this hour with us. And so our, our audience knows um, Chip very generously is going to be spending a bit more time this afternoon with a group of uh, current Tuck students in a smaller setting just to talk through some of these issues in greater detail. So in advance for that as well, Chip, thank you. I'm, on behalf of the whole Tuck community, this has been great. I'm wondering if um, the last question I could put to you is, what counsel or advice you would give to our students, in particular our current students, the 21s like Catherine, our great uh, second year class, and, and the 22s coming behind them, and even the 23s, we got at least one prospective student asking a question. Um, again, our mission is developing wise, decisive leaders who better the world through business, and you clearly are a terrific example of that kind of wise, decisive leadership. So with all you see right now, and you recall kind of this point of graduation of, of, and moving in back into the labor force, what counsel and advice would you give to our MBA students today? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think you're all truly blessed to be going to such an amazing school. And, uh, and I, I, I got to imagine, even with the pandemic and all the weirdness of the pandemic, that um, it's been an amazing experience for you. So carry the school's mantra and mission with you as you go forward. But I guess, you know, my, my advice would be, um, and, and maybe it'll sound counterintuitive coming from a CEO, but I think Part of the reason I've gotten where I've gotten to is I've always tried to have balance in my life. My life is not defined by what job I have or what title I have. My life is defined by my own personal mission and what I, what I wanna to try to accomplish in, that, in the limited amount of time that I have here on planet earth. And so having balance in my life has always been a top priority for me. And I mean, I can remember, I can remember a couple of incidents at P&G you know, where I thought, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe my career is over here, you know, I, and through some of the, the hundreds and thousands of mistakes that I've made through my career. And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, you got to have confidence in yourself and, and your abilities and your capabilities. Um, but for me, it's always been about being grounded and, um, and having more to life than just your job at the, you know, or just your career, um, whether that's family, uh, hobbies, church, whatever, but having those moments of balance that will give you perspective and will keep you grounded and keep you humble and keep those characteristics that are going to, you know, uh, you know, help you learn and grow through your entire career, you know, have goals, do all the, you know, do all the career stuff. I'm not saying that the career should be secondary. You, you've got to have goals and, and pursue those goals and those dreams in your career, but have balance too. There's more to life than a job. Yeah, Chip, I've heard uh, someone uh, wise like you once say, um, ideally we, um, uh, we work to live, we don't live to work. So I appreciate that counsel that you've provided our students and all of us actually have had the pleasure of spending this past hour with you. Chip Berg, CEO of Levi Strauss. Chip, thank you for this view from the top conversation. It's been delightful. Thanks for the time you spent with us later today and um, everybody keep safe and keep well. Chip, thank you. Thank you, Matt. It's great being here. Thank you very much. Likewise. Catherine, thanks. Thanks for the view from the top team and we'll see everybody before too long, hopefully. Keep safe and healthy. Thanks everyone.